uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to give uh, this talk here. I had been promising this talk for quite a while, and uh, I want to thank the organizers of the meetup also for having patience uh, uh, as I took my time to, uh, uh, to first read this book, uh, which is uh, Purely Functional Data Structures by Okasaki. Um, and this is the book that I'm really um, going to uh, uh, talk about. I'll, uh, I'll discuss a few data structures in this book. Um, data structures for sets, uh, to start, queues, lists, and heaps. Um, it's a fairly introductory um, level talk that I will be doing. Um, this stuff from this book is fairly classic. Like, if you want to learn about functional data structures, this book is really where everyone will tell you, start there. Um, in terms of efficiency, it's pretty good. There's better stuff out there. Specifically for closure, uh, what uh, uh, is used is really uh, hash associative uh, map trees, uh, I think it's called. Um, I once implemented this. These data structures are a bit more complicated, so I thought it, it's uh, nice if I can give some more uh, basic data structures. And, and, and once you kind of understand these, I think that's a good foundation to build on and, for example, understand how closure vectors, closure maps are implemented. Um, so I'll start with binary search trees. Um, but uh, I kind of want to ask first, uh, is everyone here familiar with uh, linked lists in a functional setting, uh, just to get an idea? Can you maybe raise your hands if you are? Uh, okay, so I would say uh, most people. Um, so that will be important, uh, that you kind of know how these work. Um, uh, especially later on when we see things like uh, random access lists. Uh, for now, don't worry too much. Um, so binary search trees. Um, here is how they are defined. Uh, so let me jump straight into that. Uh, binary trees are very simple. Uh, basically, you, you have these nodes with two branches each, and every node has a value. Uh, so, so that's an important thing. When people talk about binary trees, usually every node has a value. Uh, we'll see later that's not the only kind of binary tree there is, but um, a binary search tree is always like that. Um, and so what are these binary search trees useful for? They're basically useful for storing, uh, uh, they are collections and they are, uh, behave like sets. And that means that uh, there's no, uh, like when you add elements to sets, uh, they are basically unordered. Uh, and there are no duplicates. So if you add the same element twice uh, and then you iterate over all the elements or you count how many elements there are, you will notice that uh, the element was only added once. Um, and then the basic operations uh, are basically find, insert, and remove, and also iteration, uh, which we won't go into here. It's, uh, it's quite simple to do. You just do... Uh, 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 depth first or breadth first search uh, for those who are familiar with uh, that kind of algorithm. Uh, so to get us started. Uh, I'll start straight away with the find uh, uh, structure and, and I'll show some trees later so we can uh, have a look of what these data structures really look like and, and, and how they efficiently organize uh, data so that we can efficiently find uh, things. But the algorithm is really, really simple. It's basically um, making use uh, of the fact that we will be storing, like every node has a value, and then if we want to add a node in a subtree, what we will do is, uh, if, the, if the new element is smaller, we store it on the left, and if it's larger, we store it on the right. Uh, and, and that kind of makes finds super easy to implement. There's basically four cases. Um, so the empty tree will, we will represent by nil, 
as is common in closure collections. So if the tree is nil, you return nil because you failed to find uh, the thing you're looking for. And then if the, new elem if the element you're looking for is smaller than the value at the tree, then you recurse to the left. If it's larger, you recurse to the right. And otherwise, you have found your element. It couldn't get easier. Now, an interesting thing about this algorithm is that it's actually, uh, um, it, it can handle a lot more cases than actual binary search trees. Um, so, for example, here's a very, uh, de oh no, uh, there's arrows missing there. Uh, that's pretty bad. Oh no, how can that happen? <laughs> okay, these errors are quite important. Um, Shouldn't it make it worse? <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll have to figure this out. Let me see if I can edit the HTML. Hmm? Yeah, I think it might be a bit much. There's quite a few graphs in, uh, in this one. Um. Not too familiar with SVG, uh, to be honest. Um, Phil Nunn, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, is it too light, you think? Or it might be too light. Hmm, interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Can I not edit? Okay. I'll do it. Did you change the background color? Oh. <laughs> Thinking outside the box, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's just. Uh, <laughs> oh. Uh, it's, a, it's a neighboring country, no. From there. <laughs> oh, oh, it's covered by something else. <laughs> These colors are very different, actually. You notice. Know, uh, Oh, uh, no, that's different. Uh, yeah, no, that's not it. Uh, all right. Let, let's just stop. 
Sorry? Can we go back to the slide? Mm. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and then see what the parent is, I guess. Yeah. Oh, there's a m this thing. Yeah, I can add it to that. Wait. I'm not an HTML developer. I'm a web developer. <laughs> Not a graphic designer. <laughs> All right. At least it's visible. Uh, and it's not so nicely orange as here. Uh, anyway, the, uh, I'll continue. Uh, the, the, the point here is actually that if you give uh, find this tree, it will actually find what you're looking for, even though this is not a binary search tree. In fact, this is nothing more than. Uh, a real way to encode a linked list. Um, so, um, in a way, I, I kind of find that found that interesting when I uh, and they don't really tell you like what the exact definition is of a binary search tree. Uh, it, it's all not very precise. It kind of shows itself through the algorithms. So my point here is basically that you're not going to uh, find out what a binary search tree is by just looking at find. Why? Because if you do insert uh, on, on this tree, uh, you might up, end up with trees that um, you cannot really find stuff in. Uh, I, I don't have an example of that, but it's possible to construct. So the other point being, this kind of tree is really not efficient because, like I said, it's just a linked list. Uh, so the point then is uh, we really want to impose a very specific invariant, namely uh, that if you have a node with a value, the subtree on the left, all the values in that entire uh, tree are going to be smaller than the value at the current node. And on the right, they will all be larger. And that's a very simple principle to understand intuitively. Um, but I think it's good to like mention it explicitly. And here it is really encoded um, uh, graphically. Um, where you can see that we start, like if you look at all these values, they're kind of all over the map because uh, the place where they end up uh, is largely determined by the order in which you add the elements and maybe uh, previously re you removed some. Uh, but you can still see that this invariant, uh, like with the boxes within boxes, you can really see that this invariant is respected. Um, and so of course that's important when we write the algorithms for uh, insert and for remove. And so insert is very straightforward. You basically have the same four cases as for find, where the difference really is that with find, you return the element that you, uh, like when you make a recursive call with find, you will just return uh, the value that is returned by, um, by the call that you made. It's, it, it's, a, uh, it, it's a tail call. Um, but with insert, it's not the case because what you do is you, you, you call insert recursively and you get a new tree, but that's really a subtree of the entire thing that you want to construct. And so you have to uh, embed it uh, in the values that you already have. For example, with left insert, you uh, call insert left tree element that you want to insert. And you then construct a tree with this new uh, subtree, the, the value that you already had, and then the right tree that you already had. And so insert is, uh, is very simple. Remove is a bit more complicated. Uh, some manuals actually skip it uh, as if it's not important or as if it's too complicated. Neither is the case. Uh, a set without remove is just a ridiculous data structure as that doesn't have that much, uh, that isn't very general like the way set should be. 
And so the key thing with uh, removing is that we need a helper function uh, that we will call largest. Um, and what this does is, uh, given uh, a tree, it just keeps going right and right and right uh, and, until uh, there's no more subtrees on the right, and then it take, just takes the value there, and that's the largest value in your tree. Uh, again, this follows from the invariant in a rather straightforward way. Uh, so you need this largest function, and why largest? Well, could have been uh, least also. Uh, it, it's just a choice. You have to choose either. You either need least or you need largest, and then we'll see what we do with that. And so remove, again, has these three cases, uh, uh, four cases, sorry, uh, that we saw before. Um, if the tree that we have is nil and it's an empty tree, then there's nothing to remove, so we return nil. If the element that we want to remove is smaller than the value at the current node, then we again do uh, a recursion on the left. And we then reconstruct the tree in the same way as we did for insert. And so we then have uh, this recursion. So um, for those who don't know some uh, error function, uh, uh, basically what we do is we first take the left node. We check if it's nil. If it is nil, we stop here. We just return nil. There's no left tree. Uh, if it's not nil, then we call remove recursively. And we, what we do is we call remove left tree element. So uh, this is quite easy. Uh, the tricky case then is when, where we end up with else. And that's really the important case for remove. Because the else is basically where the current value, the value at the current node, is the same element that we're looking for. So what we do there is we take the left tree. Remember, in the left tree, everything, all values are smaller than the current value. And in that tree, where all values are smaller than the current value, we take the largest element. And we call this uh, L prime. And what we then do is we construct it uh, on this. There's two cases then. Either uh, there was actually uh, a left tree or there wasn't. If there wasn't, then it's actually very easy. We, we have uh, a node where we have a value that we want to remove. The left tree uh, is nil, and then we have a right tree. So we just return the right tree because we don't lose the left tree because there was nothing there and we wanted to lose the value so we just return the right tree so that's this case in the other case we remove L prime from the tree on the left and we put it at the current nodes and because it comes from <coughs> excuse me uh, because it comes from uh, the left subtree we know that it's smaller than everything in the right tree so we know that we respect our invariant that the current value should be smaller than all values in the right tree. And then the right tree we keep as is. Uh, <clears throat> and then I want to make a small point where uh, what we just saw is basically a way to do sets. But we can also easily turn this into a way to do dictionaries, maps. <laughs> because then basically what we're storing is not just a single element, but we store uh, a pair, namely two elements, a key and a value. And whenever we do comparisons, we only compare with the key. And finds would return the value.
Um, so there's a lot of variance on binary search trees. Uh, so one downside of binary search trees, as we saw them now, is that they can get uh, inefficient if you order if you insert elements in a particular way in a particular order. So to improve on the situation, there are things like red and black trees, EVL trees, and those things you can definitely look up. It's basically the same code, except that there's a sort of rebalancing going on every time you, uh, is it remove or insert or both uh, elements. And then a related concept, of course, is uh, binary search, which happens on an array. Um, and there, this is something that you can just think about, like a binary, uh, a sort of array, really is just an efficient way to represent a tree uh, because you just allocate a huge block of memory and then you insert your uh, elements and so you don't need to allocate all these nodes and, and jump from pointer to pointer all right uh, so i think these binary search trees are quite straightforward uh, Many of you might be familiar with binary search trees in an imperative way, and you can see that it's very easy to translate to functional setting. So functional queues. Um, these are data structures where um, you have, you're basically adding elements to the back, and you're removing them from the front. So they're quite different from uh, a linked list where you uh, add and remove the elements from the same uh, position. So it's not really, if you're new to functional programming, it's not very obvious how to do a functional queue, maybe, because a queue is usually uh, implemented in a very imperative way where you keep a pointer uh, both to the, uh, to the front and to the back end of, the, uh, of your data structure. Uh, So, uh, we will represent a queue with two linked lists. Uh, one is called front, and it works like a regular uh, linked list. And then back uh, is basically uh, a list where we store elements in a reverse order. And this time we will represent an empty queue with uh, uh, queue nil nil. So front and back are both nil. Uh, and then the second function here, to sequence, you can really see the definition of, of how we want to interpret this queue data structure. Uh, we basically concatenate uh, the front of the queue and uh, the reverse of the back of the queue. And then for head, we do a curious thing. We just get the first element from the front. And we can do that because we set ourselves uh, a restriction. We want the front of the queue to be empty only if the back uh, linked list is empty. So that is what makes head work. Of course, that means that when we manipulate the contents of the queue, we need to make sure that we keep respecting this invariant. And the way that we do that is uh, with the function check f. And it's very straightforward, uh, these functional queues. Basically, uh, we will call check f after adding or removing elements. And if the front of the queue is empty, then what we do is uh, we replace, we create a new queue, and we reverse the back queue, uh, list and put it uh, as the new front list. And then our back list is empty. So for tail, where uh, tail is like uh, next in closure. So with tail, what we want to do is we want to remove the first element and we want to return uh, the remaining queue. So basically what we do is we take uh, the front queue and from that linked list, we remove the first element with next. 
and then the back queue we keep as if and we pass that to check f for uh, snark, I'm not sure how it's pronounced uh, which you can read as the, ups, uh, as the reverse of counts uh, which is used for prepending elements in, in a linked list in a functional setting for snark we want to uh, add an element to the end of the queue so what we do here is we first keep our front queue and we just counts the element to the back queue and then we call check f to make sure that the queue that we return is uh, uh, a valid one. So uh, here's some demonstrations of how we add elements to the end of the queue. Uh, we start with an empty queue, uh, top left, and then below um, we snark one element, one. Uh, And basically what happened here internally is that uh, first we constructed a queue where n was in the back. If you look at the definition of snark, it's first in the back. And then check f moves the elements to the front. The next element uh, we append to the queue is 2. So you can see it in the back. And then we add one more, 3, and 4, and 5. And here check f doesn't need to do anything. So what happens is that the back linked list just keeps growing uh, while for the front uh, list what we do is we just make sure that there's one element there so that when we call head we get this first element <coughs> so then when we call tail to remove the first element uh, so we start with uh, the queue that we ended up with in the last slide uh, what will happen is that uh, check f will notice, oh no, uh, there's no more elements in the front, and so it reverses the backlist and moves it to front. And from there on, the only thing that happens is that one by one, we remove uh, two, three, four, uh, and five until we end up with an empty queue again. So this is one really simple data structure. Um, I don't think it's obvious that you can do this when you start with functional programming. Um, but it's definitely like, uh, I, I, I think it's a very elegant data structure. And uh, to, me, to me, I remember that it really showed like, um, yeah, this functional programming thing, maybe it makes uh, sense after all. Um, uh, critically, is yeah. maintaining the backlist in reverse order the algorithm itself. Two? How critical yeah. is it is, is uh, maintaining the backlist in reverse order to the algorithm? Is it that so it's just a quirk or is it, it can be implemented that way? Mm. So the order is very important because um, th there are some things you can uh, change but the order itself is very important because we have a linked list and with the linked list the only efficient thing uh, way to add elements is to add them at the front right so if you were to add them elsewhere uh, that would be quite inefficient but then what you can do though is uh, you might want to change uh, the point where you call reverse um, how do you use a reverse thing? Hmm? how do you use a reverse thing? a reverse? Or use a reverse linked list? Uh, well, a linked list is just a linked list that you access differently, I guess. So, uh, yeah, this, this, there's no such thing in Clojure, I think. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, yeah, you could do that, but then everything would actually remain as is. It's just that the names of your functions will be different. Uh, um, but yeah, like th this is the most easy way to implement it. Uh, there are other approaches where you will actually try to kind of keep uh, the front and back list at similar lengths. Uh, there are various strategies. Uh, and I, uh, this becomes particularly important when you do things like double-ended queues uh, and, or when you care about things like um, 
there's a pathological case here where if you would take the first uh, cue and then you keep uh, calling tail on the same thing, you're reversing the entire backlist every time. So that's actually quite inefficient. Um, and if you have a language with laziness, or you allow like, like laziness implies some imperative code, um, if you allow a, a bit of that in there, you can do uh, more efficient queues, more efficient for that particular access pattern, where, uh, where like in functional programming, you can just pass the same queue to different functions, and they don't know that they're all handling the same queue, and so they're reversing and, and appending and whatnot. And if you're passing it to different functions that each do like uh, tail, that could be inefficient. And so with laziness, you can kind of get around that where uh, uh, you have a better uh, amortized runtime. Uh, and, and this is true for closure also, right? Like uh, with vectors, it's always said like um, the uh, amortized complexity for adding an element is effectively uh, constant. It's one. Um, but that's not really true, uh, necessarily, if you think of these pathological uh, access cases where you have like, you fill a vector up with like 31 elements and then every time you add one more uh, to the same one, that, that, that's going to be quite inefficient. So laziness can help you deal with that. Um, of course, it's debatable whether that kind of use case is very important. Uh, there's also real-time queues where you can entirely avoid that you have these moments where suddenly you're, like if you have a real-time application where it matters that uh, every time you uh, remove an element, it happens in a fixed amount of time, then this is going to be horrible. Because if you add 1,000 elements, uh, then, uh, then the first time you, you, you remove the first element, the entire list has to be reversed and that's going to be quite slow. And so there's ways to deal with that. Uh, it, it can get quite advanced, and it's all in this book. You can find the PDF uh, on, on the internet also. Um, so yeah, so these are some of the variants for functional queues. Mm. Oh. All right, random access lists. Uh, and I guess that will be the last uh, structure uh, we will see here. I, I think it's the most interesting one. Uh, it's a bit more complicated. Um, but the previous two data structures are quite, uh, um, they're very simple. Like maybe if you see them for the first time, there's, uh, you, you, they might be a bit confusing, uh, but they're very simple conceptually. Uh, random access lists, also quite simple, but it's entirely not obvious. Like with a functional queue, maybe I could convince myself that I could have come up with this if I had just tried hard enough and, and didn't know that they are existed already. A random access list is just like, it's just not that obvious maybe, and, and they're really cool, I think. Um, this is not what's closure, the, random access list, by the way, means vector, like it's a vector in closure. This, this is not how vectors are implemented in closure, um, but it's a reasonable first start to implement a vector. Uh, so what we will do here basically is we will combine two concepts, uh, which is binary arithmetic and then simple trees, uh, not the trees that we saw before, um, but trees where the nodes don't have values. And we combine these two simple concepts and we end up with uh, vectors. Uh, um, and so we'll take a detour into binary arithmetic first. Um, I, I assume that you've at least seen some of that before, otherwise maybe a bit too fast to follow. Um, so random access lists, uh, like I said, they're like closure vectors. So what we will have is we will have prepend. In closure, we have append, uh, but it's the same thing really. And we will have uh, a function for removing the first element. And then the cool stuff is we have efficient lookup and updates. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so binary arithmetic. This is uh, 
a very quick uh, refresher of how binary numbers work. Um, so basically, first one is a bit special. Uh, we, we, we're not going to start with zero. We start with empty list. Um, and you can, um, when you see the algorithms, you will see that it's actually just a much more natural way uh, to do numbering. Um, but yeah, same thing really as, as, as writing zero there. Um, and then the other, then we start with one. And then, of course, we have one zero because we only have zero and one. And so we have to carry over the one. Then we have one one, one zero zero, one zero uh, zero one, one one zero. Um, I, I, I can assume that everyone uh, has seen this to some extent. Uh, the important thing also, of course, is when you look at 1, 2, 4, and 8, uh, the ones uh, where there's a 1 in the front and then, no, and then all zeros behind, uh, you basically see what the weight is of the 1 at that point, namely 1, 2, 4, and 8. So that's another uh, important thing to call in mind. And we'll call this the weight, uh, so that's an important term. And then the other thing I want to say is we're going to uh, reverse these lists because it makes the arithmetic uh, more easy. So here I've written them in the normal order that you would write them down on paper. But with the arrows, you can see that we're actually um, uh, the, the, uh, the first element for four, for example, the first element is one. Uh, second element is zero, and then uh, um, the, the front element, the one where that you're holding uh, a reference to, uh, is zero. So how do you implement increment? Uh, it's a good exercise. Uh, uh, well, when you have an empty list, it's kind of easy. You just return a list with one element, one. If the first element that you have is 1, then what you want to do is you want to add a 0 there and then carry over uh, uh, that 1. So basically, that's done with this recursive call. And then if you have a 0, it's even simpler because you just replace the 0 by a 1. And so here on the left, you can see an example of uh, carrying over uh, uh, one, where we're calling, we're hitting this path, this condition three times, and then uh, eventually we end up with this one, where we just add uh, one. Uh, decrementing uh, is also very simple. Uh, we check the first uh, uh, digit that we have uh, and then we check if, if that's the last digit uh, that we have if it was the last digit uh, because we kind of don't want to have zeros at the front we just return an empty list and otherwise uh, we just replace the 1 by a 0. And in the case where you have a 0, we do uh, a carry over in the reverse order uh, from before. You don't need to memorize this. I will show this next to uh, some, some code in the random access list. And you will see that it, uh, the comparison is striking. OK. Then we want to have these simple binary trees, and they couldn't get more simple uh, because these trees just have a left and a right branch, and they don't even have a value. So what we're doing here is basically a value is just a value. So you can see that for a tree of size uh, of size one, um, we just have the value. And then we're interested in trees of size 2. Uh, and we can do trees of size uh, 
uh, one or uh, well we did one we, we can do uh, size three and, and and odd numbers except for one uh, just fine but but we don't need them and so we won't see them here um, so here we just had the values in the left and right uh, uh, branch really and then for a tree of size four what we have is we have two subtrees and then the nodes are all values and so note that you need to know the size of uh, your tree if you're going to look up uh, the values Uh, at least if you don't want to do like runtime inspection like oh is this a tree or is it a value which is very messy because then uh, you can s store trees uh, as your data all right so we then arrive at a lookup and update and just as before with sets uh, lookup and update are quite easy to implement uh, and here we actually only need to deal with uh, three cases so all right so lookup and update uh, have three arguments in common one is the size of the tree uh, as i just mentioned it's very important because otherwise we don't know uh, wh where our values are or whether we will encounter a value or whether we will encounter a tree then we get a tree and then we get an index because what we want to do is we want to ha say what's the third element in this tree and here we can see that uh, the way these elements are ordered is really uh, in a visual way uh, from left to right uh, 0, 1, 2, 3 uh, so to get the first element you take two left second element one left one right uh, third element right left and then right right to get the last element so first condition if the size of our tree is one then we just return uh, the tree because a tree of size one is really the value itself If the index that we're looking for is actually smaller than half the size uh, of our tree, then we know that we should be looking uh, to the left. And so we just do s simple recursive call where we do tree lookup, half size, and then the left tree, and then we pass the same index. The other key uh, case where index is um, on the right uh, is very similar. Uh, we just pass half size, we pass the right node, and then we just uh, subtract half size from index uh, so that our lookup will succeed. And with update, it's really uh, the same. And, and, and the difference here. Um, note that there's an extra argument uh, f which is a function that we call to update the tree uh, the difference is really the same as lookup and updates uh, that we saw with uh, binary search trees where with lookup you just return the value that you found and and all your recursive calls are tail calls and just return the value whereas here with updates uh, you're kind of reconstructing a new tree and note that, uh, that the new tree that we're constructing here is always the same size as the original tree because we're just updating the values. We're not, um, uh, we're not modifying the structure of the tree. So how do we combine this? Um, we will implement random access lists or vectors uh, by having a linked list of trees. And <clears throat> so what we will do is uh, the first element in our linked list will be a tree of size one. Uh, 
the second element will be 3 of size 2, then a 3 of size 4, 8, and so on. So here you can see that this is a, a vector of six elements. So we want our trees to always have two, four, eight, uh, like, or rather one, two, four, eight uh, elements. Uh, either that or, or we make the trees nil. We just skip them, really. Uh, so that's what we do here. We, we want to have six elements, so we skip the first three. And then the remaining elements we just store, again, from left to right. It, 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 it's a very visual thing. Uh, we store all the elements in an obvious order. So if you want to store two values, we just skip the first three, which would, be, which would have one element, and we just store everything in the second tree, which has two elements. Four values, we skip the first two trees, which have one and two elements, and we store everything in the fourth, uh, uh, in the last tree. Six values, uh, that's the one shown on the left. And so we will implement uh, cons first and next uh, for sequential axis, and then the random axis uh, uh, will follow later. And it's here that the binary numbers are very important. Uh, you can see that cons is uh, really following the exact same structure as increments did just now. So counts means that we want to uh, add a tree to our list of trees. So if we have a, an empty list of trees, then we just create a new list with one tree. If our uh, if the front of our list uh, actually uh, already has a tree, then we can't store an element there, and we have to move on to uh, we have to carry over really what we did with increment. So we will replace the current tree with uh, a gap. The f current element in our list of trees is replaced with a gap. And we make a recursive call saying, hey, I still want to add this element uh, to the remaining list. So that's uh, uh, this recursive call here. And the interesting thing is that because we have trees of size 1, 2, 4, you know that when this happens, T is actually uh, going to be the same size as the tree that you just encountered. So we can just merge the trees that we have, the one that we want to count onto the list of trees, and the one that was already there. And we count it onto the remaining list of trees. The else case handles the case where uh, the tree that, that we're counting, we're counting it onto a list where the first element is a gap. And we'll show how that works. Uh, so <clears throat> basically here, if we want to add one element, uh, what we do is we, um, uh, we create a tree with one, uh, well, one element is just a value, right? So we can just count it straight away. And because there's a gap here, the only thing we need to do at that point to prepend this element to your random access list is you just put it there. So your node becomes uh, a value. Had there been uh, a value here already, then we would merge them so that we have a tree with two values. And we would then count them onto the remaining list. So here we would have two. Uh, trees of size 2. 
there's no gap here, so we can add it here. So we construct um, from this existing one plus the tree that we carried over, we make a tree of size four and we carry it over here. And then eventually we end up creating one tree here of size eight and the first three elements would be gaps. So for uh, the opposite of uh, cons would be uncons, uh, I guess, and it's kind of a mix of getting the first element and getting the remainder uh, of, of the list. Um, so basically, first you check, hey, does the front of my uh, list have an element? and uh, if it does, then, well, that's the first element you return, and then you just, uh, uh, you return either uh, nil, if there's no more elements behind that, or uh, you fill in a zero and then return the rest of, uh, of your list. And if there's a zero, uh, then you just drop the zero, really. And this code is actually um, a lot easier than, than might first appear. And you see that when you compare it directly with the function we saw earlier for uh, decreasing a binary number, like, uh, you have this if first you see if there's a tree there or if there's a gap and it's the same as checking is there a one there or is there a zero and then to make sure that you don't end up with uh, leading zeros you check uh, if you're at the end of your number or not uh, and then the carrying over uh, happens exactly uh, the same as with decrement Uh, and then look up. Uh, these functions really build on what we saw previously. Uh, so we saw the cons and uncons, which are based on binary numbers, and we saw uh, lookup and update of simple trees. And basically, this is just all gluing it all together. And this is basically um, uh, lookup is a tail recursive function. Um, so we start with a t size of one because the first element is always either nil or it's a no or it's a tree of size one. Uh, And then we check, oh, uh, do we have an element uh, at the front? If we have an element at the front, then we check, oh, is our index smaller than uh, the size of this tree? If it is, then we just do a tree lookup. And if it isn't, then we keep uh, doing recursive calls. And that's this call. And there's basically two recursive calls. Uh, and the recursive calls are when the index uh, uh, is, um, well, the recursive call obviously just happens if you can't look up the tree um, or the element in the tree that you currently have in your hands. And then the only difference really is uh, whether you should change the index. If you have a have a gap, as is the case here, you just keep your current index. Uh, if you don't have, if, if you have a tree there, you have to subtract the size of the tree. Uh, and then the update function is very similar. Um, the only, it just looks a bit more complicated because again, you have to 
reconstruct your list uh, in, in a recursive way. But the logic is all the same. As you can see, there's the same if let, there's the same if condition here. All right. Uh, sorry, I'm uh, running a bit late. Almost at the end. Um, there's a small bug here. Um, I don't know if anyone noticed it. Uh, I call it the limitation. Um, and it's basically this. Uh, we can't really tell the difference. Like, this data structure is not appropriate for storing nils because we're store using nil both as a gap. Uh, or we're using it to represent the gap already. Um, but then if you would add a nil, you wouldn't see, uh, you wouldn't see it. Um, so it's a very silly bug. It's, it's easy to fix in many ways. Uh, the, the reason I didn't really feel like fixing it in my code was um, not so much laziness, but there's various ways to fix it. And I'm not really sure if in Clojure there's an idiomatic way uh, to do it. Like, it. It's a very personal preference. And I felt it, like it would detract a bit from, from the algorithm. What you would do in a type language, like, uh, I don't know, Swift or, or Haskell, uh, really is that uh, you, you would use an optional or a maybe type, and you would really be able, if you stored optional things in there, you would be able to tell the difference between something that is nil or something that is just nil, uh, if, if that makes, or, or some nil in Swift. Uh, in Clojure, you don't have that, and, and that's fine. Like, that's a design decision that Rich Hickey feels uh, super uh, strong about, <laughs> and that's his right. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that this is actually uh, like one of those cases where where that can bite you if you're if you're not careful. Uh, and th there's many ways to fix it. Like you could maybe embed every tree in a list. I think that might be the closest analogy to using an optional type. Uh, so will always be a list of one element, like an extra list. Um, Maybe more idiomatic would be like you would use a namespaced keyword, like rather than having nil uh, for gaps, you would have like colon colon nil. Uh, I, I think, given that this is closure, that's probably what I would do. Uh, I, I don't know if it's a, uh, yeah, that's probably what I would do. Let's keep it at that. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I thought that was interesting, uh, uh, an interesting example of how optional types are actually very useful. All right, so um, this is really the end of uh, this talk. We didn't get around to heaps, but I wasn't expecting that. Uh, there's many variants here, um, so I just want to go over them really quickly. Uh, you can add laziness in there to improve performance, especially like the case where I, that I mentioned with uh, persistent vectors in closure, where certain access patterns might be inefficient. You can optimize that with laziness. You can do zeroless representation where you don't have zero. Instead of zero and one, you have one and two. So that's kind of fun. Uh, and, and that's actually more efficient in, in a number of ways. Uh, you can use uh, uh, skew numbers where you change the weights. The weights are not like one, two, four, eight, but they are rather uh, two, three, seven, uh, 15, and so on. So that's fun. Uh, trinary and quaternary numbers, uh, they're a lot more efficient. They're a pain to implement because you're not branching two times. Uh, like you need to write a lot more code. And then another thing is uh, using structural decompositions. And there you don't even use the trees that we saw here. Uh, but it gets very complicated at that point. And so I would encourage people to really look into that. Uh, yeah. Uh, Keep it at this. Thank you. Is there? Yeah. So for the random access list, yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking the straw man argument. What are the use of binary research tree where the values are the position and the, and the value is the number you're storing? We use binary search tree. Uh, I guess iteration would be quite slow. So that's one, uh, like with a random access list, uh, sure you have very fast random access, but you also have very fast iteration. Uh, 
you can do first, like if you get the first element, you remove the first element very fast, and that's really how you would implement uh, iterating over your elements in, a, uh, in the order that you inserted the elements. So, um, but the first element could be in a, in a very fat tree at the end. Like a, it's three of five eight, and the first element is the leftmost child in that tree. So it wouldn't be very fast to remove one. Um, well, uh, let me see. So you're just implementing it as a dictionary, is what I described, right? Yes. That's what you mean. And so, yeah, but that's not. That's not constant time, for sure. So it's slower, right? Yeah. Mm. Um. Mm. But your removal here is, is logarithmic, but it cannot be constant time. Yeah, but that, that's also, though, because this one uh, doesn't have all these optimizations. So this is kind of a toy example. It's an interesting question, but it, it's, it's a bit of a toy example. It's indeed logarithmic time. Um, Isn't the point of the binary tree to have sorted elements go here to have them in the order they were inserted in? Or like whatever? Or in that, where in the binary tree, the value, the, the sorted thing is the positions, okay. where you use it like the first and second. <laughs> And the actual value is stored as the, as, as the you know, key value. Right? So the actual value is stored in the. It's not stored, it's just stored in the loading. Yeah, it seems to me like that would work. Uh, of course, you're comparing it to this inefficient implementation. Uh, it would be similar, I think. So all the operations here would be logarithmic. Like, similarly, on, on a balanced binary tree. Could also be logarithmic. Uh, so um, I think what's the advantage that this particular method provides since it's actually more complicated to implement than just using a balanced binary tree? Yeah, um, well, you can do constant time addition, I think, with some of these optimizations. Uh, 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 appends or prepends, yeah. Uh, so. Didn't you have to deal with merging the trees? Um, well, I'm now wondering which one would have that. Uh, like the, the very most advanced version of this is really this one. And this one doesn't, uh, yeah, OK, it doesn't have the trees, so maybe it's a false comparison. Um, but I guess it's fine. I think maybe it goes mm. up to something that yeah. will eventually and have some better performance later on, yeah. like the more complicated version. Yeah, exactly. Like, uh, I'm not sure which optimization is, is really key here, but yeah. For this naive uh, version, I guess you're right. Uh, let me think about it more, though. Some naive question. Yeah. Are immutable data structures and functional data structures semantically the same? Uh, they're the same by definition, yeah, yeah. Uh, I would say. Uh, I mean, this kind of thing, you will always have authors who have like a very quirky definition maybe. So, um, because like maybe functional data structure, like the title is actually purely functional uh, data structure. So that kind of implies that you can implement it without mutation at all, which is a bit of a lie because this book uses laziness a lot. Um, but then maybe persistent data structures um, some forms of mutation would be fine as long as you don't expose this to the user as long as you like uh, as long as you can just keep passing it around and and pretending that this mutation is not happening uh, but essentially it's the same yeah uh. Uh, yeah actually for example, uh, closure vectors are a great example. It uses a lot of mutation under the hood, and they're implemented in Java, and they use array lists or, or just regular arrays. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, regular arrays, I guess. Um, um, so yeah, that's a lot of mutation. That's not functional enough. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, 
Any more questions?